and Hawk's very special guest. I'm going to take it over to them for the intros on Zoom. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Good to see you, Jen. Great to see you, Hawk. It's a really exciting interview today. Um, the only thing that I'm going to mention is in the last year and however many months when I thought, okay, pandemic lockdown, I'm gonna catch up on every classic film from the 30s, 40s and 50s that I've never seen or have forgotten. And the only films that I really wanted to go back to were Nancy Myers films, current Nancy Myers films because they're so comforting. They brought me such joy. So I'm really excited about today and wanna get started. So thank you, Hawk for opening up your Rolodex once again. Well, thank you, Freda and, and Jen always. Uh, and I am excited to speak with Nancy Myers. Nancy is one of our top American filmmakers, both commercially and critically. When one says a Capra or a Wyler or a Wilder or a Hitchcock or a Tarantino film, we all know what that means. Nancy Myers is in that category. Her films as writer, producer, director include The Parent Trap, What Women Want, The Holiday, It's Complicated, The Intern, and my favorite, Something's Gotta Give. She was nominated for an Oscar for the original screenplay of Private Benjamin and wrote and produced Father of the Bride and Father of the Bride Two, Baby Boom, Irreconcilable Differences, and others. But none of that is anywhere near as important as the fact that Nancy is a terrific grandma to <laughs> two Koch grandchildren. That's right, Nancy's daughter is married to my son. So there was no way Nancy could turn me down for this interview. So welcome, Nancy, can't wait to get started. Come on in. Thank you, Hawk, I'm here, thank you so much. And I too watched every movie on Turner Classic Movies for the last year and a half. I'm now on my second, oh my God, I wish my kids would stop texting me. I'm on my second viewing of everything that I saw for the first 14 months. So I'm with you on that. Well. Thank uh, you for all the nice words. I appreciate it. You got it. It's Well, it's true. I, I like to, I, I deal in truth in this interview. It's funny. <laughs> so tell, I, I know we're gonna talk about movies and everything that goes on there, but I would like to know, you grew up in Philly. Give yeah. us a, just a little bit of a peek into your upbringing. Okay, um, I am one of two girls. Uh, my mother lived for a period of our lives next door to her sister. At one point, our grandmother moved in with us. You know, very family centric and very female, I would say, centric household. Uh, lots of girls and women, sisters, cousins. Um, my my mother uh, was a person that did a, a ton of volunteer work, worked for Head Start. She would work for the Home for the Blind. She was a very giving, very warm, very funny person, I would say. And I mean, just had a big, you never met her, right, Hawk? I don't think so. No, I didn't get to meet her. Uh -uh. Very adorable, very winning personality, which well, I, I wish and, I but, um, and, um, and my dad was a World War II vet. Um, he had been a prisoner of war, and that was very, very, uh, very big in his psyche, almost. As I think of him through my childhood, I always think of that part of him. Um, <clears throat> and he was a kind of adorable dad. And, um, you know, I, for some insane reason, got hooked on show business as a young girl in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I don't know where this came from. Did, did your parents take you to movies? Yes, they took me to theater, a lot of theater, took me to movies, took me to a lot of theater. You know, a lot of shows would try out in Philadelphia before going to New York, and we would have tickets to everything. Not brilliant seats or anything like that, but, you know, really, uh, really showed me that. And my parents belonged to the Book of the Month Club, and uh, one day uh, Moss Hart's Act One Act showed one. up in some form in the book of the month club and I read it. And I think that be that between that and my parents taking me to the theater a lot and adoring movies, of course, I got hooked as a child, got involved in local theater productions as a little teeny person acting on a stage. And uh, you know, that wasn't a big, uh, you know, but what was I gonna do, write the play? I mean, so that wasn't, a, that wasn't. Was there, was there a, 
a play or a musical that you saw that you just, you came home and you were singing it or, man, I just love, your parents could see how much you loved it? Um, I would say almost every single thing they took me to just captured me and just held me, you know, for a very long time. And I would go through that, you know, the, the what do you call it? The bro brochure, you know, and I'd memorize the pictures and who's who. I don't know, I just became interested. And my parents encouraged it and let me do all that local theater stuff. And then I... Now, did, did, did they give you or did you have... Did you have a journal or a diary? Did you start to write at that time or it was more uh, No, I would no, I was not. But I was a writing major in college and then I came out here at a very early age because my sister had moved here. So I came out at a very early age and June of uh, what year was that? 1972. And I got a job in about 3 days. It just a, and, a, and what was your first job? A job, a job I wouldn't recommend to anybody who wants to make movies. I worked for Goodson Todman. Ah. Goodson Todman. And uh, anyway. And it's still on. It was show business. <laughs> there's, that, that I there's, wanted to there, there's that joke, right? I'm in show business. I can't remember it right now, but it, there is that joke. I, I think I may have been that joke, yeah. So did you, as, as so, you were... I didn't go to film school or any of that, you know, but so I, so I took classes when I got here and then I landed a job with Ray Stark, who was, as you know, the biggest producer in town. Yes. Well, you might, I don't know if you know, but I was president of his company in the eighties. So well, that was before you. Yes. And I understand that, that you and Ray had a difference of opinion, which I had all the time also, but he, in fact, let you go, I guess, is what was the reason why he- the job I've ever been fired from. Uh, and at the time it was, it was hard, but you know, now I can look back on it with some laughter. Um, well, I was working with a writer. I was his story editor. That's not a job that exists anymore. I don't think they could call anybody a story editor, but I was the story editor for Ray Star. And I was working with this writer who I thought was just absolutely great. And he was very encouraging to me and my ideas and he helped me become a writer actually. But anyway, um, we were making notes and kind of pitching some a rewrite on his script, which was a pet project of Ray's. And um, my pencil broke and I went down the hall and into the Xerox room, you might remember it. You were at Columbia, right? That yeah, the, the, the motel row. across the street, yeah. yeah the bottom row, right? So I went into the Xerox room <laughs> to sharpen my pencil and there was a man typing on a typewriter in a car chair on a little table. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm writing whatever the name of the thing was. I said, well, you can't be writing that because I'm, I'm working with the original writer. And I said, well, I, I, Ray's hired me to do a draft too. So I went, so I went into his office. Didn't I ever tell you this? No, it's great. Office, and I said, hey, listen, I just met a man in the Xerox room who's writing a version of the same script that we're working on. He said, so? Oh, God. And I said, so you can't do that. You can't have two writers writing the same movie. He said, I can do whatever I want. I said, I don't really think you can. I don't think that's fair. But I got fired. That's that moment, <laughs> in that moment. Perfect Ray, perfect Ray. So I other than- a writing career. I started writing immediately. Other than that, did you learn anything from Ray while you were there? Or other than not to hire two writers for the same project <laughs> um that you use later as a producer oh i can't say that i did he was lovely to the talent i saw that i i heard him on phone calls with uh john houston and robert redford you know i was privy to a lot of things yeah, uh, for, my, for mine it was nancy reagan reagan how so what do you mean when i was president Reagan was president of the United States. So Ray was, anytime I walked into his office, he was on the phone with Nancy Reagan. Oh, really? That was, that was his. Oh, oh, oh. But, uh, uh, so now with some, but I heard. Bernstein had an office down the hall from me and I loved him. I loved him. Oh, and wonderful. Great guy. For me, it was Marty Ritt. Well, Marty Ritt was in next door. So all of the, I, I would say I learned more from those people. Yeah. I wanted to remember right now I remember some story and I can't but Betty White helped you get going is that true oh I'm so sorry about the beeping 
Well, when I was working on the game show, Hawk, uh-huh. um, that was before I went to work for Ray. And uh, I was writing, I was working in the game, I was working on the prices right during the day and at night I was writing. And my favorite show was the Mary Tyler Moore show. So I was doing my best to write episodes. One day I would figure out how does one get a spec script to a TV? I had no idea. You know, I was not a connected person. I didn't know anybody. So I wasn't sure how to do that. But anyway, I was working on it. And um, Betty, Betty became the guest star on a pilot because in Tobin was doing it. They asked me to work that weekend and work on the pilot. And, um, and I sort of handled her a little bit, you know, kind of got her to and from the set and stuff like that. And she, you know, of course was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. So I was, you know, beside myself with joy. And so um, at the end of the weekend, she was so sweet and so nice. And I said to her, um, I wrote a Mary Tyler, I want to be a writer and I wrote a Mary Tyler Moore episode. What would I, how would I, you know, I was like that. She said, give it to me. She said, just give it to me. I'll read it. Oh, I guess it wasn't the last day because I remember she came in the next day and she said, I read it. I think it's terrific. She said, I'm going to give it to them. And wow. then, yeah. And then Alan Burns called me and, you know, and, it, and they called me in and yeah, it was amazing. And they called me in. And, I mean, I was 22, I think. Wow. And they called me in. I think they thought I wasn't quite ready, but they said, we'd like you to observe here for a while. See what you think. Just, you know, sort of hang out. And the other kid that they had observing was Jim Burroughs. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> we sat in the bleachers for a week and watched the show rehearse and all that stuff. Anyway, um, I, it didn't turn out that I, I didn't really continue to try to write one of those, I don't think, but I quit my job. I wasn't fired this time. I quit that job and uh, decided to pursue writing. And I tried that for a while and you know, I needed to also make money that's when I went to work for Ray. And I also thought I would learn a lot here about how movies get made. He took me on my first movie set. I loved that. It took me to Which the- Which was? Do you remember what it was? Girl. Were you there? <laughs> the Goodbye the movie? Girl. The Goodbye Girl with Richard Dreyfuss. Oh, yes. Were you the AD? No, but I, if I was, I, I was producing with Neil Simon uh, and Ray a movie called Bogart Slept Here and we fired De Niro on day seven of shooting, Mike, Nich- Mike Nichols directing. Yeah. And two years later, Neil Simon rewrote it and it became The Goodbye Girl. And- I heard all about that on Turner Classic Movies. Yes, yes. So uh, yeah, oh my God, amazing, just amazing. So now- Get with me one day, I'm gonna go over to wherever they were shooting, I don't remember, come with me. And I was so excited. I was gonna go be on a movie set. I was in love, you know, I was in love. So were you, at that point, were you just like watching all the old movies and all the, were you going to movies every day or watching? I don't know where you could watch. I always had a job. So I wasn't all day watching movies, but at night I would, I was trying to write. I was trying to write. I gave that up for a period when I was working for Ray because I was reading scripts for him at night. Right. uh, As I said, from the writers and directors that he introduced me to and that were working there, um, you know, I learned a lot. I left there ready to do it. And, I, and Private Benjamin came out a year and a half later. Wow. Well, so were you, because I know when I talk to, when I would talk to a Marty Ritt or whoever, yeah. we, we would have a f- familial thing about, you remember in this movie when that happened or when this happened or that piece of dialogue, were you already now kind of, educated as far as uh, you know the old movies I guess what I'm asking is who were the writers and directors that you admired Do, could you talk about Capra or Wilder or Weiler at by that time uh, pardon me did I start well I was sort of self-educating during the 70s I was, That's what I was asking yeah that's a better question were you self-educating at, in the 70s <laughs> I was, I was, you know, and I became friends with a lot of young writers in town and, you know, somebody would turn us on to a great script they got a hold of or a great movie they saw. And yeah, I would say, um, you know, Billy Wilder's about as great a writer as there ever has been in Hollywood. 
Wilder and his partners. He never wrote alone, you know. Yeah. I went to school with IAL Diamond's daughter. Oh, really? Yes. Did you meet Izzy? Huh? Did you meet Izzy Diamond? I, well, I did. I met him once, but his daughter, I, Anne, used to say his name is IAL Diamond. <laughs> Is IAL? Yeah, that was the first three initial I period, A period. Everybody else called him Izzy, but not me. I have a picture of them in here somewhere. Ah. Is there a favorite of I have of, a picture of them in here, but I've had this on my desk for 40 years. It's oh. the yeah. Is is the apartment your favorite of his? Yes, I think it is. Yeah. Because it's perfect. Uh, it's a it's perfect. Well, that, that's it's that's a, pretty good. It's a, it's perfect. a drama and it's a girl's story, it's a guy's story, and they have separate stories. Yeah. It's just so beautifully told. It's impeccable. The writing is impeccable. And that's written well, by I A L Diamond and Billy Brown. <laughs> was was there a time during this period or any time actually? when you saw something like the apartment and you thought to yourself, oh, I, I, maybe I'm tilting at windmills here. I can never do anything as good as that. You ever have that insecurity? Oh, yeah. oh, I look at things like that as um, something to try to achieve as opposed to try to shut me down, you know, try to learn from it. I, I'm not kidding. When I say this has been on my desk for 40 years, it's, a, it's always within arm's reach. Yeah. Things I just, I'll read, you know, I once typed it. I once typed the script. When I was really young and learning, trying to learn, I, I thought I will just type it. And it's amazing what you learn from just copying something uh, that way, you know? It's like painters, like kids who are learning to paint in a museum. I mean, you just look at what they did and how they did it. And you try to, to teach yourself. Wow, I, that that's great insight. I couldn't teach myself to be that smart, but I can I can try to always be influenced. And uh, and and you have you have made a lot of films that that stand up there with them. So congratulations! I got, I got to work with Wilder. Uh, oh, on what? Well, when Charles Shire and I um, were uh, writing together, we sold Baby Boom to MGM UA. And we were really lucky because somebody else wanted, wanted the script also. We had written it on spec, but we had heard that they hired Billy, Billy Wilder as a consultant to the company. So we said to our agent at the time, Jeff Berg, we want to sell it to them. Can we work with Wilder? Is there any chance he can in any way be part of this? So what happened? It absolutely happened. It was, I mean, honestly, I was so tongue tied at that point. I was. It was hard for me, but I mean, he read it. He said nice things about it, <clears throat> you know, and the whole opening voiceover of Baby Boom, I really studied the narration of Sabrina and it was so clever the way it was written. And I tried to wilder it up the best because he's great at narration. And yeah. uh, anyways, Charles and I worked with him for several months. Uh, he had really funny ideas for the script and. Oh man, that's. He took us to lunch every single day. And if anybody watching knew him, you, they would know this to be true. If he says to you, the egg salad's good, and you go, oh, really? Okay. Then you say, you know, I'll have a grilled cheese. He said, I still get the egg salad. You know, it was like, it was a little bit like that. So it was a little scary, but I, but I did, uh, I was tongue tied, I think really around him. Oh man, I, I, I met Frank Capra once. So, I mean, just, I couldn't even speak with him. So I, I, I know to meet Billy, I never met Billy Wilder, wow. It was, it was well, and also to just have him going over it, you know. Just oh, I mean. By page. Well, what if she wasn't, I like that, but maybe you could, you know, it was like, we did that for about six weeks. It was, I, it was. I mean, that's, that's the best. First of all, it's the best education anybody could have in this ever, business. Ever, ever, ever. Oh, wonderful. So how did you get, the, where did the idea of Private Benjamin come from? Oh, the idea came from, uh, well, I was seeing a psychiatrist in Pasadena 
So it was always a bit of a schlep to get there. So one day on the freeway, <laughs> I was somewhere around Studio City when it came to me. I'm not kidding. I, I just, well, the, way I, you, the way you said it. I have no interest in the army. So it's not like, you know, I was, I, I don't know. I don't know how the, who knows where ideas come from. It's crazy. I don't know. So you just had an idea. What about a, what about a nice Jewish girl? No, I did not have an idea of a nice Jewish girl. I had an idea of a, a girl who accidentally joins the army, which is kind of what happened there. Yes. And at the time, I was ghostwriting TV pilots with Harvey Miller, who was Charles's best friend. And Harvey would basically go in and make a deal on a pilot and then make a deal on another pilot. Then he could only write one of them. And then he paid me he would make about $25,000, I remember, and he paid me 2,500. But I actually wrote, so anyway. So we were, we were working together in my house when I had this idea. Charles was writing with somebody else. He would come home at the end of the day. Harvey and I would still be writing together. And am I gonna get in trouble for having ghost written for Harvey? Well, no, 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 not at all. It was a hundred years ago, it's okay. No, you're not getting in any trouble. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so anyway, so I told them that night, we're sitting around, had a glass of wine at the end of the day. I said, I had this funny idea, I think about, and you know, and Harvey had been in the army and Charles knew how to write a movie. And we joined forces at that point. And we said, this is such a great idea. But, and Charles always would say things like, we're gonna knock it out in six weeks. And I was naive enough to believe him. Six months later, we had two acts. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wanted, it. Nobody wanted that movie. Nobody wanted that movie. I heard that. And I heard that uh, Goldie had an agent who didn't want her in it. Is that true? That, no, that's not true. That's oh. not true. Actually, it was her agent that actually got it sold for us. Because back in the day before everybody flew privately, there was a chance you could actually see a studio executive on an airplane. And her agent, Stan Kamen, remember Stan? Very well. He was flying back from New York and Bob Shapiro, who ran Warner Brothers, was next to him. And he had the script in his carry-on. He made him read it on the plane. That's how he tells the story. That's, that's how Stan, well, good for him. Um, now, was, was, Howard Zeef, was Howard Zeef part of that package at the time? Uh, no, he was not. It was just oh. Charles and Harvey. So as producers, now you're, you're producing Howard Zeef had made a couple of pretty good movies till then. Yeah. How did Howard Zeef get that role? Or was Charles thinking about directing at that time? Or? He, wasn't. he wasn't. I honestly, I honestly, to be honest with you, I don't remember, but Howard, I don't remember. Oh, sorry, I do remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we had another director uh, whose name escapes me quite, oh, quite. Better quite short he had directed that really funny movie I'll elliot silverstein cat baloo no oh okay because elliot was not tall uh no um you know, it wasn't polanski because he's short but not polanski he's done a lot of big comedies no i can't remember who it was but uh i'll i'll tell you later and you can post it somewhere um but he left the project he was worried perhaps that it was anti-Semitic. Really? Because uh, it's very rare, you know, to have a Jewish leading character. And I thought she was quite heroic and had a, a journey that a lot of people could relate to. So I thought it was quite the opposite. So, so he left during prep or were you yeah. already shooting? Yeah, we were kind of prepping. I remember being in casting sessions with him. So I forgot about him. Oh, damn, what's his name? Anyway, I can't think of it. Well, maybe somebody will, well, I don't know. Okay, so now, now you're shooting your first movie. Yes. Are and you I'm, and Charles on the set every day? I'm pregnant with your daughter-in-law. <laughs> well, and did, you know, and did, shooting's hard enough. Being pregnant during it is really hard. So, so you and Charles were on the set with Howard and Goldie? Oh yeah, every second. And so you were, I mean, I know you pretty well, not not really well, but I know that, you know, you're pretty controlling. 
better than most people who know who interview me. I would say we are somewhat related. Yes. What do you uh, mean by controlling? Well, my my question is, I'm just trying to picture a director working with an actress and the the two writers sitting behind the video, you know, going, "Can we talk to you a minute? <laughs> How about if you try this? I mean." How did that work with another director? Howard was collaborative and I was friends with Goldie, uh, which is how we got this script to her. I'd met her through Ray Stark, actually. Um, <laughs> you have a story there. You, you Tell us this story. Come on, Nancy. I, I don't want to. So <laughs> I had met her through, I met Goldie through Ray and uh, she had asked me when I got fired she called me right up and said, be a producer with me. Let's, you know, she was one of the first people, first actors that I can think of that took charge of their own projects. So I didn't want to develop movies with Goldie. I wanted to write movies. So, you know, maybe when I was on my way to my shrink, I was thinking about Goldie and the army. Maybe it all came together there. I don't know, but she's the one we wanted from day one. So anyway, so I was close with her. So she was uh, very comfortable speaking to me about her part and what it was about and what this scene means and how does this scene connect to the next scene and Howard was fine with it. That's what I was saying. You did, at least Howard was aware that you were doing this and he was okay with it. Yeah. 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 I worked with Goldie on her Oscar winning performance in her first movie, Cactus Flower. Oh, right. Walter Matthau, yeah. And Ingrid Bergman. I got to work with Ingrid Bergman. Oh, wow. wow. Um, okay, so, so the movie, you know, you finished the film and now you're in the editing room. By the way, just to go back to controlling, because I know I had a bit of a reaction to that, but that's what a filmmaker is. That's what good ones are. <laughs> if you're not controlling the material, and I don't mean to the extent that you're not allowing other ideas in, but if you're not you're in trouble, right? I, I totally agree. The, the, the directors, the directors I've worked with, and I've worked with some pretty good ones. The pretty, the, the really good ones really do know. I mean, we, I mentioned Polanski before, but both on Rosemary's Baby and Chinatown, everybody on the set knew exactly what he wanted before we ever got to shoot him. Yeah, same. I mean, and and he he controlled. There's, I, I know you worked with Billy Fraker a couple of times. I worked with Billy on both Heaven Can Wait with Warren and Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. And I'm just curious because Billy was one of the, loved him, one of the sweetest guys I know. And, I, loved, I loved him. Yeah. And he could get along with just anybody. I'm just, he, he could get along with our former president. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great guy and, and excellent at his job. Yes, really good. So now the, you're in post uh, and you're editing. And are you are you and Charles in the editing room now with Howard or are you waiting to see the director's cut? And- um, I don't remember that well. I had a baby while he was editing. So I can't quite remember. I think I'd been to the cutting room, but yes, of course we saw cuts and gave notes and yeah, we were- right. yeah. Okay, and now- I didn't go to work in the editing room. I think Charles went more than me because he was not having a baby. Right. And the movie comes out and it's a huge smash. That's what they told us. And I remember when they called Saturday morning and said, we're a hit. I said, how do you know? <laughs> that sounds ridiculous to people who make movies now because you know before it opens how it's doing. But, yes. but I was so naive, you know, I, my first movie, I said, oh. right. And now the movie goes out and does really well. And now you, you and Charles and Harvey are nominated for best original screenplay. And you, two years awesome. before, several years before, you got fired from Ray Stark as a story editor, and you're sitting at the, I don't know, Dorothy Chandler or the the Dolby, wherever, and you're nominated for an Oscar. Tell me, tell us about how, what was going through. Where'd you get the? I'm sure some of the women watching. What dress did you wear? Where did you? Well, what that, you thinking? Year, that was the year that the Oscars uh, were postponed on the day of because Reagan had been shot. So I was dressed and ready to go. And back then there were no stylists, there were no hair and makeup. Honestly, it wasn't that kind of a thing. I bought something to wear. 
and I washed and dried my hair, <laughs> you know, and I, and I, and so as the car was about to pick us up, we got a call. It's the, do you remember this Hawk? The Oscars were postponed yes. The, yes. the next day. I knew, I knew the producer. His name was Howard W. Koch. Oh, okay. <laughs> my dad was the producer that year. My okay. dad produced eight of those shows. It was the next day, right? They only postponed overnight. Was it the next day or the, a couple of days? I can't remember, but yes. It was the next day. We uh, put the, I put the outfit back on, washed my hair again, and I went. And, you know, it was very okay. exciting. You're, you're sitting there. Now, you've, you've met Goldie. You haven't met Billy Wilder yet. But you're, I've been to the Oscars a few times, and you're sitting there with all these stars and all these major producers, directors. Goldie, we were in the first row. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, you know, you're you're there with probably Jack, or you know. Daisy was behind me. I remember it. Yeah. Well, were you were you this giddy? I mean, you're still you're probably still in your twenties. I mean, amazing. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm thirty. No, I'm thirty because I had. Your, your daughter-in-law then. And I had her baby sock in my pocket for good luck. I remember yeah. that. And we you lost. didn't win. We lost to Bo Goldman. For? Howard and Melvin. Ah. And Harvey, my writing partner, along with Charles, in the car going home. I remember, I don't remember that much what was said yesterday, but I can remember Harvey saying, hey, he didn't make up Howard, he didn't make up Melvin. Why is that an original screenplay? <laughs> it was a very good movie, actually. I love that movie. Yeah, so, I did too. I, I did, but I love Private Benjamin. Thanks. Love Private Benjamin. So now you finish that film, you you and Charles and Harvey, or just you and Charles are now writing and what your next oh, thing is going to be? Charles, yes. And were there... Was the next one uh, Baby Boom? Irreconcilable Differences. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Small, and, it was an indie before they were called indies. Right, and where did that idea come from? Oh, our lives, pretty much. Because we had this success so early, um, I think we were worried about how to navigate things. So it's a story, although it's got this kind of hooky premise, what it's about is a, is a couple that's destroyed by success so that's what we wanted to do and that's what we wrote and um we had a good cast and uh fraker was with us and it was not a lot of money and it right. was kind of fun to make i mean it was okay. really small amount of money you know i was bringing clothes from home and pictures off my wall and putting them on the set and yeah now was jeff berg your agent at that time or yeah. yes so right from the beginning jeff was your agent yeah yeah, yeah. I interviewed his brother the other day on this program, Scott. Oh, he's great. Yeah, terrific. So now, were there um, were there obstacles at this time that you remember? Uh, did you were, or was did everything? I mean, today, no matter who I talk to, I don't care how big they are or from nowhere, everybody says, "Oh my God, it's so impossible." to move forward. Yet I remember in the 80s, it seemed to be a little bit easier to get movies made. Was that true or not? Did, was that an easy movie to get money? Um, I'm sure making it for the price we made it for wasn't our first choice. So it's probably wasn't a studio movie. I honestly don't remember. I'm sorry. I wish I did. That's Charles, okay. A better memory than me. So I just remember being very happy shooting it. And I just remember it I liked the people that were in it. I loved Fraker. I don't know. I liked that experience a lot. But I didn't see the movie for 30 years until about a, two years ago. Why? I don't, well, I don't like to watch them. And uh, I really liked the movie. I wasn't sure I would, so I avoided it. And it's not a movie that's on TV because it's kind of obscure. It was the best reviewed movie I've ever been involved with. Wait a minute. So, did, have you not seen all of your movies, or just I've that? I've seen one? them all, but that one I hadn't seen in thirty years. You know, there's a story that Cary Grant, when he would go to the Chinese theater for the premiere of his movies, would go in the theater, you know, do all the hoopla on the red carpet, and then he'd go out the back and leave because he didn't like to watch himself on camera. 
Well, that's crazy because there's no one I like to watch more than him in the world. <laughs> in the world. He's my yeah. absolute, I think he's the greatest screen actor that's ever lived. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he has chemistry with every single woman he's in a movie with. Yeah. He, and Sheridan. I watched him and I married, I was a male war bride about two nights ago. And I thought, if you can have chemistry with this woman, you are a genius. And he did. And he did. He, he, he was amazing. And he I, was if I'm ever, I don't know what to do, I'll go, I'm going to go watch a Cary Grant movie. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Yeah. Now, one movie was a career killer for Katherine Hepburn that I still love with Cary Grant and uh, A Certain Leopard. Oh, Bringing Up Baby was a career killer? She, be, it did no business, it got horrible reviews and she didn't work for two years. Oh yeah, that's why she bought the Philadelphia story. Yeah, that's yes. right. right, right. Well, you know, it's a long game movies. <laughs> I kind of remember that. <laughs> and it's painful at the moment, but She's wonderful in that movie. Now, now you had, there was a woman producer on Irreconcilable Differences, Arlene right. Sellers yeah. and Alex Winitsky. Right. Uh, but, and you were producing or exec producing and you had written, there weren't that many uh, uh, women producers at that time. Was that, did- I love her. She was absolutely great. She was fearless. She uh, so believed in this movie, put up her own money, wrote a check, well, she and Alex wrote, their, wrote the checks. And um, she was totally behind us. She was in our corner. She was a team player. She was not tricky. There was nobody else to speak to but her. So that- right. I mean, yeah. Wow, yeah. cool. So that, that I'll bet also helped you as a producer later on. Having yeah, she was very encouraging of me. She was great. She was really great. And after Irreconcilable, because that was kind of, you were thinking about your lives, did you always continue most of the time to write about things that were happening to you? A lot of people say, you know, uh, um, you know, the one with uh, Meryl uh, was kind of your life. Did, it's did you? Yeah. Um, well, not, yes and no. I mean, I never had an affair with my ex-husband, which is a big part of that movie. Right. I have an ex-husband and I can see the humor in that relationship for sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, All right. Really but were there other personal experiences in like baby boom, you just had a baby and were you, I don't think you were willing to give her up. <laughs> no, it was about somebody having a baby, not giving, it wasn't about giving it up. That was a different, uh, we don't know who gave up the baby. She inherited a baby. Right. Yeah. yeah. Kind of hooky and premisey because nobody was going to make a movie about me coming in and saying, hey, I have an idea about what it's like to be working in the mid 80s and also have a baby. I want to write about my experience. Think I'm going to get that made? No. no. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when we pitched this movie at uh, one studio, I won't say where, um, the person who was running, it was the head of the studio, fell asleep while I was pitching. Oh, God. Completely nodded off like boing, 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 his head went down. Um, so, you know, uh, so it's a good thing we had that hook of the comedy of, oh, a career woman couldn't possibly be good with a child. <clears throat> so, um, you know, so that was a movie, yeah, about what I, I feel that um, I was going through more than Charles was. Well, your films do do have a lot of really deal with female empowerment. And you're a shining example of that, I must say. You know, or someone who has to find it somehow. How does that, I mean, do people come to you all the time because of what you've been able to put up on the screen or in a script? And, you know, I want to talk about this stuff. What, are you mentoring uh, younger people with this kind of stuff or? Well, no, people don't know how to get to me, really. I mean, so, no, I don't have people coming. Nancy's number is 555. <laughs> I do have a 555 number. No, no you don't. That's how into the movie business I am. Um, no, no, but so it's not like there's a lot. But yes, over the years, uh, you know, I have 
been involved with other women's work and tried to help them. And on my crews, I always hire women. I will always hire women department heads and not just in the art department. Right. Yeah, not really hard. Well, uh, let, let's talk about art department just for a minute because okay. aside from everything else that your writing does, everybody I talk to says, you know, oh my God, Nancy Myers, her, her movies production design are the most beautiful. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. I just love it. I mean, I remember sitting with Molly and, and looking at the, uh, at the kitchen in It's Complicated, you know? I, I mean, just what a kitchen. I want that kitchen. Was that something even growing up? Were you always about that? You have great taste, Nancy. And I'm not blowing smoke, I really do. But it, but I don't know why, I, I don't know. My, because the apartment didn't particular, the movie The Apartment had kind of a crummy apartment with a little fridge, I remember, you know. That was the plot. I know, <laughs> Nancy, I'm kidding with you. It was a crappy little place. <laughs> uh, you know, I. Uh, my, my grandmother and my mother were, uh, you know, moving furniture in our house was a, a regular occurrence. You know, I'd come in, I'm just practically going to sit down on that chair, but it's gone because she's moved it over there. You know, it's, they were always moving furniture and my mother would be refinishing things in the garage and we'd be going to flea markets on weekends. So there was a lot of that stuff in my house growing up. My grandmother had, uh, was an antique dealer for a while. And I had zero interest when my mother would say, come on, we're going to go to wherever out in the country and, you know, go antique. And I go, please don't make me go. It was not, I was not like her star pupil in that area, but somehow. Through osmosis, I guess. Through osmosis, the uh, kind of um, love of home, a love of home became, became something that I was interested in and, uh, you know, so my movies, for the most part, other than like the intern, which mostly takes place in an office, they take place in somebody's home. And yeah. as you know, uh, we directors are shown fabric samples and paint colors and this sofa or this sofa. I, I go through the same process the guys do. Somehow I go that one and that one, or I'll show, I'll make a Pinterest board and show them what I'm thinking and I can help guide it, you know, but it's not like, I, I don't know. I pay attention to it, but you know. Um, Are there movies that you've watched and you went, oh, I, that production designer or that set decorator, I wanna work with him or her. Uh, well, I worked, uh, I think the movies that you're referring to, I've done them all with John Hutman. Yeah. And he's a great collaborator and we really speak the same language and it's very easy with him and he's very open. And if I present, I remember in the Something's Gotta Give house, I drew it for him, not well, by the way, but only because of a comedic moment where they, Diane comes out of her bedroom and Jack comes out of his bedroom at the same time. So I had to have them on opposite sides. So we'd build a set where the living room could be in the middle and he was on one side and she was on the other. Right. And, you know, uh, so it's story-based. It's well, story -based. actually. But I, I thank you for thinking they look so good, but honestly, there's so many beautiful TV shows and beautiful movies, there are. There are many. Well, but what I like is you, you working. I love in those sets a lot. And I think that has something to do with the coziness of what people feel. Well, what I, what I, what I love is that you're loyal to the people you've worked with before. And because this is going out to the residents of the motion picture home, I always talk about how making a movie is, is my other family. And I wonder how, because obviously, it has to be a family when you're working. How do you, I mean, don't you feel the same way that this is your other family when you're making uh, uh, Yes, I do. I feel, I do feel that. And I try to hold on to those people in my life. You know, my, at my longtime editor, Joe Hutching, I talked to him probably two weeks ago. Hutman, I talk to all the time. Uh, there are people that I've worked with over and over. It, you know, sometimes they're not available, which is painful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I just, better. they make your life better. Yeah, I think back of, you know, five movies with Gordon Willis or six movies with Paul Silbert as a production designer, you know. I did two movies with Dean Tavalaris. Oh, wow, yeah. 
Yeah, that's Coppola's for anybody who doesn't know. He did The Godfathers. Pretty good. Um, okay, next. Tell me about your, you're with Charles. You've met him. You're co-writing. You've gotten married. You've got one child. And tell me about the process of, again, you're writer producer and he's director producer and you're both on the set how does just give us a little insight how that process worked because you guys made several movies that way um he's a very very easygoing collaborative person and um values other people's opinions and i was his writing partner and his producing part he didn't produce i don't think i think i produced he directed but he may have i don't think he took producing credit but it was a team effort so it was not like him. It's not in his world or his way of thinking to be in front of the monitor without, he wouldn't begin if, I, if, if there wasn't room on the camera truck for me, someone else had to get off. Ah. He, mm -hmm. he wanted our partnership to be our partnership all the, all the time and all the way through, you know? Right. So uh, the actors were, were fine. Everybody was fine, you know, as long as he was fine with it, everybody was fine with it. Okay, so you guys are now very smoothly. You guys are, you know, you're the hot young writers, producer, directors, yeah. and all of a sudden you get a call from uh, um, Steve Martin. We heard from our agent that Steve Martin was wondering if we would look at Father of the Bride for him. And had you did you know the film before you yeah. got this call? I never loved it. I never loved Father of the Bride. I love Spencer Tracy. Love Spencer Tracy. But uh, it was never one of my, like, because that would have probably kept me away from it, to be honest. I think it was kind of healthy that I had a healthy distance from it. And so, so what was, what, it was a how, did you get, how did you get the, you know what? I, oh, I see a way. I know how I can make it ours instead so, of what it was. I had two daughters, and this was a movie, two little kids. But it was a movie about, it's not about a wedding, it's about a parent who can't let go of their child. You know, I don't look at movies in terms of the one-liner that's in the paper in the morning. Do they still have TV listings and newspapers, whatever. I don't I think. I, do. <laughs> I, don't have, I haven't seen a newspaper in years. Oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> Online. At any rate, you know what I mean? The one-liner, I to me, uh, I, so anyway, he, he, someone had written the script. He wasn't happy with it. He wanted us to take it over. And uh, so my way in was it's about a parent's love for their child, which was very easy for me. What, is that like a helicopter parent these days? No, nothing, nothing like that at all. No, it's about not wanting to lose them in your life. They get married, they move out of your house. So there's all those moments where it's my last night in my house. It's like, you know, it's all that stuff that would mean a lot to me. And me. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, um, so that was my way into it. And when Steve Martin has always been one of my favorite, favorite actors and uh, comedians. Uh, I mean, he's, a he's just a genius, right? The, so, great, the great fly Dini. So, yes. So the thing about writing for somebody is what a blessing because you know they can do it. So, you know, you have to protect your writing a little bit. If you're not going to get that person that can pull that off, you can't let them get hurt and, and not be good. You know what I mean? You have to be protective of them. So now we're writing for Steve Martin. So we're not going to do the Spencer Tracy version, right? We're going to do a version that can, where Steve can shine and make it more of a comedy but not lose any of the heart. That's the trick, don't lose the heart. And you succeeded, and you succeeded. And it worked, and it worked in great measure because of him. He, he was just incredible in it. He went for the big jokes and the big physical stuff and he went for the, for the heart. Yeah, and then you did a second one of those and that one also did really good business and was very well received. And then how come, what happened all of a sudden you decided to Become a, a, a director. Well, um, you know, somebody said kind of writing and not directing or what was, what did they say? It's kind of like eating hors d'oeuvres all the time. You never get to the main meal. You know, I never really felt that because 
I was always very uh, present. You know, we were attached to the hip, which was probably not the healthiest relationship, but anyway, that's how we managed to, to do it. So, um, so we wrote a movie that, uh, that I was gonna direct because now my kids were older and I felt I had wanted to direct for a while, but they were too little and I didn't wanna do that. I didn't wanna be, he was gone more than I was. You know, he'd be storyboarding on a weekend in the office and I, I'd be home with the kids. And anyway, at a certain point I thought, well, I can take that on. And so we wrote a movie um, that called Love Crazy that we sold and, uh, did we sell it? I can't remember we sold it, but I know we got Hugh Grant to be in it. And he was extremely hot and I was wildly happy. And a day after he agreed to do it, he backed out. <laughs> so, was that because he was driving on Sunset Boulevard? I don't think it was that night. Ah, okay. So we had three months of meetings with him. He takes these decisions very seriously. He, we had readings with an English accent, with an American accent, blah, blah, blah. you know, he was very attracted to it, but something he felt maybe wasn't really right for him, but, uh, but he finally said yes. And we were all gonna go to Chasen's that night, if you can believe it, and celebrate uh, when he changed his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we had developed the parent trap at our company at Disney and we had written it. I had always loved, loved that movie as a child and uh, we were gonna have someone else direct it. So we had this ready to go movie. And uh, so I slipped into that because I was kind of heartbroken over the Hugh Grant situation. And so, uh, so after about a month or so, I thought, you know what? They wanna make this movie now, it's ready to go. I'm gonna direct that. And that's how that, but so I'd wanna direct for a while, but that's how I ended up. That wasn't really the movie I wanted to do first, which by the way, was a really hard first movie. Oh, yeah, with all the effects, I mean, how to do, all you know, you've got, yeah. 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 Well, also there weren't a lot of women directors at that time. Um, how did, uh, did you get support from other women directors or, I mean, do, were you even aware of, Geez, there's only, you know, a handful of us. I didn't really think about, you know, I was so busy with my family and work. I wasn't really keeping my finger on the pulse of who's doing what. I, I knew there weren't a lot of women directors, but, and I'm sure I knew others. I'm sure I must have, right? Nora directed a couple of movies around that time. Yeah, just, just a few, Nora. No, yeah, there's never been a lot. Yeah, well, how, do you think it's changed much now? Yes, there's, well, there's many, I mean, listen, you can't really get too many studio movies made now that aren't superhero movies, right? So uh, it, it seems there's a lot of movies being directed by women. And even now, I think the collective consciousness has moved people to even hire women for superhero movies if they want to do them. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, and there's such brilliant TV now that women are running those shows. I mean, I think things are, for a long time, I've been asked this question every time I've been interviewed for my entire life. And for a long time, my answer was always, no, I don't think things are better. I don't think things, I think things are better. I'm sorry I asked the question. No, I'm not. No, no it's the obvious question. No, but, but I do think things are better. No. So, Someone said after writing the screenplay, casting is 80% of directing. Do you agree with that? That's a high number. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell, me about, tell me, talk to me about your casting process. Do you write, when you're writing, do you go, oh geez, do I hope I can get Hugh Grant or Steve Martin or whatever for this part? Yes, I do. And then you go after them. It works out. I wanted Meryl Streep for It's Complicated from the get-go, you know? And I wanted Jack for, and Diane for Something's Gotta Give. And I met with Jack and Diane before, once I had plotted out the whole movie, like I, I spent quite a few months, a long time working on it. And then uh, Jim Brooks introduced me to Jack and I went up to his house and I pitched him Something's Gotta Give. And I said, I wanna write it for you. You don't have to promise me you're gonna be in it. No one's gonna say, yes, I'm gonna be in your idea, obviously. But do you like, would you be in this kind of movie? Because if you think, you know, and I had had some movies that I had made at that point on my own and he had liked them. And uh, so that's why he met me. And he said, uh, I always wanted to be in a tuxedo comedy, which is an expression I had never heard. And so I said, fair deal, great. I'm gonna write this for you. We'll see if you wanna be in it, I hope you will. But 
thank you. You've given me all I needed to hear. And then I met with Diane and she was more receptive in terms of, yeah, like, because I knew her and I'd already made three movies with her. Yeah, that. of course. He said, yeah. but you're never getting Jack, forget it. You're never getting Jack and you're never getting him to be in a movie with me. I said, all right, I'll see you in about six months. Let's see. Well, they had done a movie together. They had done Reds. I know, but when I got them together, once they both said yes and we were making the movie and I got them together, they hadn't seen each other since the set of Reds. Hmm. So oh, it wasn't like they had kept it. Yeah, they were so great in that movie together and they did a great job in my movie. Now, uh, I, got to work, I got to work with Jack on a small movie called Chinatown. And uh, I know you, you tell a story about Jack's process as an actor that I think everybody out here listening would what probably is love to. Hmm? What story is that? About how, what he thinks through. Oh, he thinks through everything. And yeah, well, I don't know, I, I saw it on one of your interviews. I, I do research, Nancy. Okay, well, I'm not sure what story it was, but um, yeah, he thinks through everything. He, he breaks every scene down into beats, puts them on index cards. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Index cards in his pocket before, before we roll. He looks at them, puts a rubber band around them, puts them back in his pocket. He, it's really great. And I, I'd spend time with him seeing how he breaks down the scenes. He's right on. Well, I think you also said, I think, <clears throat> or maybe Jack did, it's even though you're gonna shoot this scene, it's gonna be three weeks till you shoot the scene that immediately follows it. And yet Jack already knows what the next, his first line is in the next scene. Right, he often ends the scene with his first line of the next scene. That's what I thought was really interesting, yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. And yeah, he, found, then he'd look at me, I'd go, whoa. And he'd look at me and say, isn't that what comes next, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. He's a pistol to the nth degree. Yes. Well. Yes. No, I just, I have a, just a quick Jack story that. Uh, I love Jack stories. He was, he was nominated for, for Chinatown, and I was lucky enough to be sitting behind him uh -oh. at the Oscars. Yeah. And when they announced the winner, it wasn't him or Pacino for Godfather. It was Art Carney. Oh, and I love that movie too, though. What was that movie called? Harry and Tano. Was it Harry and Tano? Go to New York. No, no, that was another movie. That no, was it, was, it was, can't remember which one it was. But the last something. Um, any rate, I leaned forward and I said, Jack, I'm so sorry. It's the best performance I've ever seen. And he turned around, he looked at me, he said, he called, used to call me Bullhorn because I had a loud voice. He said, that's okay, Bullhorn. I'm a shoe in next year for Cuckoo's Nest. And he won the next year for Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, wow. I'm a shoe in I'm a shoe in for Cuckoo's Nest. I love that story. Um, are there other actors that you can think of kind of that Jack, kind of idiosyncrasies or uniqueness that, that you've, kind of enjoyed or had to probably sometimes work around their idiosyncrasies that you can think of? Well, you know, some people are good going first. Some people want to go second. You know, I always ask them, you know, what's better for you? Uh, some people don't know the words in the master. So you have to do a master so they can learn the words. You know, you adjust, you adjust. Right. And aren't there some, there some actors Alec Baldwin likes to set ice cold. So we'd be shooting in the summer and I would be in a down jacket and earmuffs. Who, who was this? I didn't, I missed Alec Baldwin likes to oh. set really cold. You know, and uh, <clears throat> some people like to keep going and going. Bob, you know, De Niro will pick up and do it again and again. He loves lots of takes. Other people feel judged with too many takes. The nicest person I've ever directed is Eli Wallach. I, I got to work with him. Yes, I agree with you. Wonderful. Man. I mean, he he would stop me in my tracks with the things he would say to me. I'd rush over, I'd give him a note, and he'd say, thank you so much. I would never have seen it that way. Mm. Oh, wow. Thank you very That's great. You know, like, appreciative, you know? So Wonderful. Were there, um, oh, geez, what was the question? I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, were there actors 
that you knew after three or four takes they were going downhill and you had to, because I know you like to do a lot of takes and uh, what would happen, because I know actors that are not very good after take five. Saying that, well, if they're good on four takes, what more do you need? But I see them sometimes just the first five are no good. That's more of a problem that they've gone downhill. If they've done it great, what are you going to do? But when they right. don't and you're on take six. Right. No, and, you, have to, you have to. It's what I don't like about directing, you know, because the walk from the monitor to them, you have to figure out how do I best say this? So they're comfortable and encouraged and yet understand that wasn't really right. It could be done a different way or, you know. Yeah, well, again, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have this great Warren Beatty story because when we're doing the, the last scene of Heaven Can Wait, where he's in the tunnel with Julie Christie and it's a close-up of Julie and her line is, oh, you're the quarterback. I don't know if you remember the movie, but- I remember it, that movie so well. Uh, and we were on take 50. And every time Julie would say, what do you want, Warren? And he would say, I want one more, Julie. And we finally quit on take 86. Well, I've never, you know, when you say I do a lot of takes, they're in the low teens. Oh, that's not a lot of takes. I've never done anything. Well, some people don't like that. No, no that's not a lot of takes. Wow. Well, what's Warren after? What I mean, you got to observe it firsthand. I, I wish I knew because I honestly, I've been looking at a lot of actors behind, you know, from behind the camera and the video. And I don't think we used take 86. I think we probably used about take 20 in that scene. I don't know. Said to you privately, she's just got, she's, it's just not. The, no, no, he didn't. When you write it and direct it like he did, I think he wrote that script too with Buck, right? With, with well, with Elaine too, Elaine. Okay. okay. Yeah. When you've written it, you're, you're cursed with hearing it a certain way. When you're a director who hasn't written it, I think it's easier for, to, to be up to the interpretation of the actor. But when you have written it and you've lived with it and you've said it, um, I mean, how many times I have performed my movies in this chair? A million before they go out into the world, right? And you go, no, not, don't say it like that. <laughs> no, actually, I, actually, I'm quite happy some of this. No, I, I get to know if it's going to land. You know, I don't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're uh, the first with that. So, uh, so I don't know. Maybe that's part of his thing that he's. He, and sometimes, you know, when I do uh, more and like Jack would say, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm digging for gold. Just let's do it. This is so good. Just keep going. Yeah. You never yeah. know where it's going to go, you know, yeah. how much even better it can get. Yeah. I, I always liked when, when a director knew they got it and then said, okay, I've got it. You know, now go do whatever you want. Let's just see what else comes up, yeah. you know? Yes, that's what that's what I would do with Kate Winslet in the holiday. She would always like the shits and giggles take. Boy, she was good in this mayor of East Town. I don't know if you saw it. Huh? Fantastic. Oh, she was amazing. Just amazing. Um, so have you ever thought about writing in a different genre other than rom coms? Uh well, or in the world of comedy, because like comedy, Bob. Yeah wasn't a rom-com and the intern wasn't a rom-com but they're comedies with people so people call them rom-com i uh, no, i don't really want to did you ever was there ever I, I, that's all i'm asking you always just wanted to do this i like this genre i right. i am very comfortable in it and um yeah i'm not interested in thrillers mysteries adventure no space no social network or i no. love Social Network. I think that's a great movie, but I don't think I would probably do that very well. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about focus groups because I've had a little experience and so have you. Yeah. When you, when you've previewed your movies uh, and you, you know, in the old days, it took longer than it does today, but you'd wait outside, you'd get the cards, they'd come up, you know, you'd, you'd go down and sit behind the focus group and you'd listen did you, did they make a lot of sense to you? Did you listen to them and go, oh, 
man, I didn't even hear that. I didn't know that. I better go back and reshoot or I better re-edit because of that? No, I haven't had that experience. I, I work with Gary Marshall on a movie called Nothing in Common with Tom Hanks. And Gary would, would have about eight jokes in a scene. And oh, the, right. yeah. the first preview, he'd put these four in. The second preview, he'd put those four in. And the best four of the, he'd put in the third preview to see how they all melded. Did you ever do anything like that? No, we just have a script, it's the Bible, we stick to it and we perform it and there it is. You know, I do, I do friends and family screenings and I also do a preview without the studio before the studio sees it because I don't want to be thrown by something, which right. I never have. Every time I do that, I say, why weren't they here? And then someone reminds me because you wouldn't let them come. So, you, you know, uh, I, I, that's not a great evening. Of, of, <laughs> you know, it's, it it's not a great evening to have to do it. But, but if there is something to learn, you'll you can learn it. You can. Yeah. Um, so a few years ago, your other daughter, not my daughter-in-law, right, wrote a script and directed a movie that you produced. Yes, I did. Talk about that process of, you know with my daughter or trying to, well did you have to kind of swallow a few times I mean, how did that work between you know as a parent I'm sure there were many times as she was growing up I'm not mentioning her name just for other reasons but um uh as she was growing up I'm sure you parented no don't do it this way do it that way so now she's written and directing a movie and you're producing it right. and you're on the set again she asked me to do it, you know, like she came to me and said, I've written the script. I'd love you to read it. I'd love you to give me notes. And if you like it, I would love you to be my producer. So she opened the, yeah. So she, it, it, you know, it wasn't like I was assigned to her. Right. right. So I was invited into her process and she was like her father or maybe we're all like that, just very collaborative and open. And I sat at the monitor with her. She would look at me. I think this, what do you think? I give her what I think. You know, it was, a, it was a good experience. It was actually a good experience. And it was kind of amazing to hear her say action, you know, after growing up on my sets. Did, did you and, and did the two of you get closer because of working together like that? Probably, I would say that they, it's a shared experience. It's like taking a trip with somebody, you know? We'll always have that time we went to, you know, Morocco or whatever. It's kind of like that. Yeah, no, I... We were in the trenches together on that movie. That when it, The difficult people were difficult for both of us. The people we love to hang out with, we both love, you know? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have that with any of my children, but I did have with my oldest son, uh, he was the key set PA on Wayne's World. So he was always there with me. Uh -huh. And I, we have a shared experience and a history that we can always, it's, it, it's not us. Hey, what happened? So much you do together. There's Almost more. Like this. Oh, sorry. Are we done? I, I just lost, I just lost everything. I don't know why, um, but I lost everybody. Hi, so Hawk, we can still see you and hear you. Oh, all right. I don't know what happened, but I'm gone. I mean, I could hear everything, but. All right, so, so we can uh, see you and hear you. You may have gotten a notification on your computer that then hides Zoom. You can call Zoom back up and open that window. It's a Zoom world that we live in now. I think. The one thing through the pandemic is um, doesn't matter where you are, we will always be able to talk to each other on Zoom. We'll always be able to connect. Okay, wait a minute. I have to find uh, I have All right. to find while, the, uh... while you keep looking, can I ask a couple of questions? Sure, sure. Um, I grew up outside of Easton, speaking of East Town. Um, where, like you said, the suburbs of Philly, was there? I grew up, actually. I'm sorry? Where did you grow up, actually? Uh, Phillipsburg. Oh, I don't know that. Well, I grew up in Drexel Hill. 
Okay. Which I mentioned on the show, uh, partly, and I was in Balakin with partly, and we moved. Yeah. So, in watching Mayor of East Town, did it um, bring back a couple of memories every every now and then when you'd see the the over the top O? We lost Hawk. I'm sure he'll be back in a moment. There he is. Oh, I'm back. Well. No, uh, I, it was so many years ago I was there. We didn't grow up on one of those kind of streets. It wasn't exactly like that. So, but I did like the accents. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. All right. Um, keep, keep going. If you have another question, I've got a few questions left, but. Uh, yeah, there's one other MPTF connection. Um, so the television station has been going for about 15 years here. And not about, we just celebrated our 15th anniversary. One of the women that lived here until she was 105 was a, a character actor that you had on Something's Gotta Give. Um, I know who she was. Who was she? Connie Sawyer. He was in the scene in the market. One, of the, one of the two women. That is correct. Yeah. And she spoke so highly of you. Oh. She said, you know, I, I had a long career. I started doing singles which was stand up back in the the day and here i am doing character pieces and bit parts and little comedy moments and i don't get residuals if i don't say three lines and i i went to the director and i said can you please help me and you said without question no problem absolutely and those small things that help the members of our community I want you to know it made a difference for her and, and she could not could not say nicer things about you. Oh, that's so nice. Oh. Very sweet. Great. I met Connie. She was great. All right. Well, we're going back now. Gonna yeah. ask some political questions. Well, maybe it's political oh, questions. Oh, God. this is going on. I mean, it's <laughs> come on. We only have a few minutes left. We need uh, to talk to people. Go ahead. I don't know if you saw the uh, Tom Rothman uh, thing on Deadline the other day, his interview about what lit his fuse and everything. And he yeah. had a very interesting discussion about uh, our people are gonna go back to the movies. And I would love your take on, do you think uh, the movie theater is dead? Do you think streaming is not the way of television or VHS or whatever else, but because of streaming, we're not gonna make movies anymore for the theaters what did tom say he obviously thinks we are right yeah tom tom felt that he literally went through the history of television and he was wanted to talk about everybody said nobody's going to go to the movies anymore and you know we've been in a pandemic and then there was vhs and then there was dvds and every time it's the same thing but i can tell i'm just looking at what's going on in China and what's going on in New Zealand and Australia, they are teeming to go back to the movie theaters. And I know that everybody I know can't wait to go back to another restaurant or the beach or wherever. And Tom said, the only thing that could kill it is if it's always day and date. He hoped that we could keep a window between when it opens on in the theater and when it, when it plays on streaming. Right. If I were to make another movie, I would make it for a streamer. Why? It's going to end up there anyway, within a few weeks. Yeah, but I mean, In the Heights is opening tomorrow, I think, or what, Thursday. I've seen the trailer on television, but I want to go to a movie theater to see, right. huh? Yeah, well, I don't want to go be in a theater in a mask. I, th th I'm not that comfortable in my mask that I want to be in a mask in the theater. So I, you know, I think after a year passes, we'll know a lot more how comfortable people are. And also for the most part, the movies that are made for movie theaters are not necessarily movies I'm really dying to see. But I wanna see your next movie. I wanna see the detail, which I can't, I don't care how big my screen is at home. I can't see the detail of your art direction of, I like to watch an actor on a hundred foot screen and see every I mean, listen, nuance. This is what we grew up with, they were bigger than us, not smaller than us. 
they're smaller than us now. And I think that's uh, doesn't help becoming a movie star, that's for sure. Well, you know, and we, my friend and we, who's a big actress says, they're TV stars. He said, no, it's a movie for, she says, they're TV stars. They're on TV. I get it, I get wow. it. Okay. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I hope for our business, movies can stay in business. Why, uh, why do you think people, do you think, that we have dumbed down our audience? Why do you think we're not making, I don't know, name it, in the heat of the night, uh, something's gotta give. Because we're not making great movies anymore in, in that those other genres other than- Because you know, I think to get people to pay the money to go to a movie theater, which is not just the price of the ticket, but the sitter, the parking, et cetera, et cetera. And the, you know, going out. Well, but it's cheaper than, it's cheaper than going to a baseball game. It's, it. it's not cheaper than Netflix or Amazon. So, and you can watch it and watch it when you want, how you want, the room you want to be in. But so I think to get you to come out, they're making these certain kinds of movies that you can't get on Amazon or any other streamer, you know? And right. so in the heat right. of the night, we'll probably find its audience on a streamer. Okay. So All right, we'll let that one die right there. Isn't that it, Hawk? No, but isn't that it? Isn't that why they're not making those? They can't make it, they can't get a big enough audience for that because the audience has now been, we've, we've learned to watch great dramas at home. Yeah, I, I still think if a movie is great, people will come. I hope uh, you're right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What, so do you ever, I don't know if you ever speak at colleges or universities or anything, what, what, what advice would you give an aspiring filmmaker today that you probably couldn't, you probably would have, would have done something different 15 years ago? Something that, that I've learned from? Yeah, what would you, uh, someone comes up to you who you know has some talent right. and say, what do I do, Nancy? I gave this advice two weeks ago, I was talking somewhere. Oh, at a film festival. And uh, I've always said this though, but this is not a new thing. Just kind of write the movie only you can write. The one, you know, the one that's really you, that you know how to do. That's what I always say. That's what I've done. I think, I think the movies that I've made that have lasted with people, they're right up my alley, you know? I was the right person to write those. I'm not the right person to write a lot of great, I couldn't write Mare of Easttown, which is to me as good as any movie. I love the writing, but I wouldn't be great at that, you know? So I don't follow trends, you know? Uh, right. I never have. Right. I do what I think I'll do better than somebody else doing that. Or, or at least I'll not, maybe not better, but at least what I can do best. And I always give that advice. Write the one, don't, don't, and really don't do this year's version of last year's movie. Never gonna work. It's never gonna be remembered, you know, in the long run too. So what's next for Nancy Myers? Um, well. Other than, other than attending her grandson's championship Little League game. We did meet there over the weekend, which yes, we did. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm talking to a couple of people about a couple of things. Not trying to be mysterious, but it's just sort of. But you're not. You're not quitting. You're. You're gonna. You're gonna keep going. Retired? Is that quitting? <laughs> Is that quitting? I don't know. Making movies are really, really hard. You know, like they're really, as you know, it's something. And uh, so I have been enjoying not working. When I made The Intern in 2015, and then I produced Hallie's movie in 2017, uh, making two movies within three years really kind of set me back. I was a little bit wiped from the, all of and it. And then you did a great job with uh, uh, Father of the Bride 3 on Zoom. Listen, if I can direct from this chair, I would direct from my dying day. Well, that's how Francis used to do it. Oh, it's just so great. I love doing it from home. I absolutely loved it. Well, I know that uh, Jen has a question that she always asks at the end. Uh-oh. So, Okay, John. It's the hardest question. It's actually two questions. Okay. Um, what is your favorite movie? Well, we already know that. She told us, I think. But go ahead. Well, I mean, sometimes it's said in context and then people change their mind. Right. 
I don't know that I have a single favorite movie, but I would say The Apartment is as close to perfect as I've ever, and I, you know, I'm not unique in this point of view, certainly. I just love it. I also love Two for the Road, the Stanley Donnan movie, Frederick Raphael script, Two for you the know, Road. You know, I just watched it again. It was one of my favorites also. A great script and yeah. um, so interesting. It was a very interesting marriage that it dissected. And I love the way he, you oh. knew from the car what period it was and what was happening. Oh, it was great. Go For ahead. me, the apartment is one of the best last lines of any movie. Shut up and deal. Shut up and deal. Yep. Right up there with nobody's perfect, right? Yeah, I was going to say, because right. my favorite of his is Some Like It Hot. So, Which was, by the way, a placeholder. There's a placeholder line till they can could come up with a better line. Jeez. And you can't. You just can't. It's really funny when you think about it. It was really funny. Yeah. Um, okay, so the other wrap-up question. We've been compiling all of uh, people's favorites, favorite movies throughout the first part of the pandemic. And then we thought, with the motion picture and television fund, let's give TV a little bit of love. What's your favorite TV series? Oh, ever? Ever. Um, oh, I don't know. Mary Tyler Moore? Mary Tyler Moore show. I really loved it, loved it. But I watched a series during the pandemic uh, that was a masterpiece called Poldark. And I loved it as much as anything I've ever gotten lost in. Poldark. Poldark? Poldark. Spell it. Spell it. I'm excited to be able to tell people about it. If they, a lot of them know. P-O-L-D-A-R-K, it's a masterpiece, but it's on Amazon now. And uh, it's, it's about, it, it, there's a marriage in it. It's a period British thing, you know, but there's a marriage in it that goes through so many things over so many years that was so beautifully written, so nuanced and great actors. And I would say, I don't know whether, I don't, I don't want to blame it on the pandemic brain that I had. I fell in love with it. And told everybody that I that would listen to me that they need to watch it. All right, uh, I have it down, and I'm sure that I will now be sent on the mission to go find Pole Dark and bring it onto the closed circuit TV station. Yeah. Oh, there! Oh, I hope they love it. All right, I'll see what I can do. Um, and on a very personal note, thank you for the holiday. That's that's a a Christmas must for for us. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate well, Nancy, it. this has been uh, an absolute pleasure. I hope that uh, you enjoyed it as much as, as I did, and I know the residents and everybody it's else did. Very, very nice talking to your in-laws. My uh, we in-laws? No. What are yeah, we? We're Mishpuka, I think, in some way. The Maka, what's that other Yiddish word? Maka Tainister. That's cool. <laughs> but uh, no, I, 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 I really appreciate and I feel closer to you, and, and uh, I can't wait to see you again at another sporting event. <laughs> okay, you got it. I'll be there. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.